this morning. In the name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Well, if I put this uh, particular picture up, I think for probably the majority of you, of you here would immediately um, know what it is. It's a picture of Martin Clunes and uh, Doc Mart as Doc Martin, that very well-known BBC drama. Um, I don't know, just an interest. How many of you have actually watched uh, Doc Martin? Not as many as I thought. Oh, put your hands down. If you've got a television and you've never watched it, 10 series over from 2004 to 2022, then if it comes up on a different channel, watch it, record it, because you'll enjoy it. I think you will. Family, family fun. And it's all about a, a doctor who had been a surgeon, and he develops a phobia for blood. As a result, he retrains as a GP and is based at what's called Port Wen, which is actually Port Isaac on the North Cornwall coast. Very nice little place to visit if you can, if you're down in that way. And one of his big issues is that he is really socially inept and he speaks abruptly and argues with his patients. But that is all part of the fun of the drama. And it's a very interesting series, and it's very watchable. Um, if, you've, um, if you've never had a phobia over blood, well, then you're, you're probably amongst the few people who haven't. Um, I gather even nurses sometimes have phobias over blood, and they go into the first operation, and you have to watch it carefully, or they faint. And maybe you do have a, a phobia. I think it's called hemophobia or hemophobia. And people can even recoil or even faint at the sight of blood. I guess the worst place would be would, to work would be an abattoir. It doesn't bear thinking about, probably, for the majority of us. But how important is blood? We thought about it with the youngsters. There are a few creatures, a handful of creature types, that don't have blood. But the way that God has made us and the way that we work... We need blood, and we need a heart, and we need, as one youngster said, we need oxygen being pumped around our bodies just to live. So our, our muscles, our joints, our sinews, how we uh, can see and hear and speak, really everything revolve around having uh, this wonderful gift in creation of a blood and, and heart to pump it around our systems. And the subject we have this morning... And some of you may have thought, oh no, I can't possibly listen to this. Well, I, I hope that isn't the case for you. But it's a vital subject in the Bible. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 17 that we're reading, why is blood so special? And don't worry, we're not going to concentrate on gore and difficulties. But God has laid that before us in his word. And there's a lesson, a very important lesson, and lessons to learn from it. I think the key verse is the one I've got up on the screen. For the life of a creature, or the flesh, I don't mind which translation you're using, the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It is quite clear that God regards blood with a great deal of importance and significance. If you were to go back even to the beginning of the Bible, where Cain sadly murdered Abel, God spoke to him and said, What have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground, and you're now under a curse. It was something that God attached a great deal of importance to. And when you look at the Bible, you can say there's two things here. There is the physical aspect... But there's also a spiritual aspect. There's a it's a metaphor for life and a great significance running through the Bible. And we'll look at that as we go through this morning. Uh, but we mentioned that word atonement. It's not a word we see in common parlance. What we need, mean by atonement, I've probably said this before, because the one thing I learned as a child, just think of that word 
as at one meant. It was describing how it's been possible because of what God has done for us to come together to be with God, to be one with God, when actually we've been separated from him because of our sinful nature. It's a similar word to reconciliation in a way. It's that which has brought us together uh, with God. Now, the original meaning of the word actually was to cover, to atone, was to cover. And it was really linked to and derived from the Ark of the Covenant. Now, if you've been a Christian for a number of years, you'll be familiar with this. If not, you may have watched the Raiders of the Lost Ark of Harrison Ford fame when he was trying to track down this allegedly uh, art biblical artifact, as they saw it, which had the, the, the key to human existence and somehow was still around. You won't find it. No, no one will find it now. It's long gone. But they chased all over the world with the Nazis in, in pursuit, uh, trying to get hold of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this, this is a very significant part of the furniture of what was called the tabernacle, that's a tent in the wilderness, which then became the temple. And it was in the very, very holy place that the Ark of the Covenant was to be found. Only the high priest could go there, and we'll think one or two bit of details as we go, go through. Um, but that the atonement cover, or the uh, seat, was the top of this Ark of the Covenant. And above that, you can see the cherubim, the angels, signifying the holy presence of God with their wings outstretched. And so it was called a cover. Now, it became more as a word remove, because when we think of atonement, it's what God has done to remove our sin from us and our guilt. But even the word cover, um, if you go to a restaurant and have a meal, and someone says to you, oh, you carry on, I'll cover the bill, we know what they mean, don't, don't they? They're not going to somehow hide it and, uh, so that no one can see it and pretend that there's no obligation. They're going to cover it, they're going to pay the bill. So it's, it's, it's a similar type of thought, but that's where it's come from. So we are, we are resuming this series that you are working through in Leviticus. And I think I'm sure my calculation is right. It means that last time uh, you were looking at Leviticus, you were in chapter 16 and talking about the annual Day of Atonement when blood was deliberately uh, spilt in the Holy of Holies on behalf of the sin of the people. Is that right? Do you remember that in your series? Paul would say, yep. <laughs> you had a preacher book, uh, speaking on it, I'm sure. How long ago was that? A year. Wow, wow. So you won't have much memory of what uh, came up before Leviticus 17. So briefly, we're going to think about the practice. What is actually spoken of in these verses? But I really want to get to the heart of it and, and look at the principle or, or look at what they were signifying because that's the important thing for us. We can look at what God spoke to the Jewish people but see what that anticipated and for us in our day to day. So then, I mean, we're talking about a sacrifice to God. It wasn't a meal that they were preparing. The animal would have been an ox or a lamb or a goat. And incidentally, there wasn't wanton waste of what would be food. Uh, if you look at some time in your own time, look at Numbers 18, you'll see how the Levites were provided, their food was provided by the other tribes because they didn't have flocks and herds. So many of these sacrifices were then used um, as food, as meat, uh, for the people to eat. And the, the big problem that God was highlighting in these verses is where the people were making these sacrifices and what the point of their sacrifices were. So God had asked that they would be brought to the temple and the sacrifices made there. But what people were doing, they, they were doing it away from the temple, maybe even out in the countryside and making sacrifices to God. And it wasn't just they weren't doing as God said. 
uh, it was a real act of disobedience because they were not even worshipping the true and living God. And you may remember that we read the verse 7. They must no longer offer any of their sacrifices to the goat idols to whom they prostitute themselves. Not only were they going against the direction of God, but their whole worship was away from God. They were disobeying the word of the Lord. And God considered it so serious that he said that they were guilty of bloodshed. In other words, doing something which was totally wrong. And uh, we read just now that if people were doing that, they had to be cut off from the rest of the nation. God is putting down a standard. He's saying what should and should not happen. And if the people disobeyed him, they should be cut off from their people. That's verse 4. The, the heart of this disobedience and the, what lay behind this was actually the worship of God alone. What the Israelites were doing was worshipping the foreign gods. They were worshipping the gods of, for example, the Canaanites, who were a grievous people who did all sorts of evil things, including sacrificing children to their gods. So we are talking about a very wicked influence which was around the nation. And why would God's people want to sink to that kind of worship? It's beyond belief, isn't it? And what God's intention was is that people should worship him and him alone. In the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 5, you shall not bow down to idols or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I, I used to struggle with that as a youngster. What does it mean that God is a jealous God? Surely jealousy or envy, they're very similar thoughts, aren't they? Surely that is a sin. And that's backed up in Galatians 5, verse 20. It lists as a sinful thing for people to be jealous now, what do we think of? Well, we think of perhaps uh, jealousy in, in a sense, or envy, as you've got something I want. A bit like covetousness, in a way. You know, you've got good looks, you've got, you're very talented, you've got plenty of money. Whatever it is, uh, I'm sort of jealous, and, and I want it for myself. Now, God is not like that. God is the creator of the whole universe. He's eternal. Um, why would he need anything from us? And of course he doesn't in that sense. He really doesn't. But uh, I think a good example, an illustration of this is um, if a husband sees another man flirting with his wife, he would rightfully be jealous because his wife belongs to him. And equally, the wife can say, the husband belongs to me. And what God is concerned about is that the people whom he loved, he chose, he created, he provided for them, instead of their love and devotion coming to him, they were going to false gods, gods that are no gods whatsoever. God has created and redeemed us. And he wants our love, even as he has shown his wonderful love to us. And then another person will say, well, look, yeah, I, I get all these commandments, but surely the penalties that were given to people were very, very severe. And you can read through the law, and people struggle with... Re I, Leviticus is not an easy book to read. Those of you who know your Bibles well, you know, I'll, I'll start off at Genesis and Exodus, and you get all the, the, the narrative and the stories and miracles, and then you get to the book of Leviticus, and it can be hard reading. Uh, if you don't think so, well, enlighten me later. But it's true, isn't it? Because we see the laws and the regulations, and we see the penalties really coming out there when people disobey God. And people say, well, why is God like that? And God appears to be a different God in the New Testament. Well, I think there's five thoughts. First of all, God is sovereign. He is the creator. He is the one who sets the rules. We are the creation. He made us. He's entitled to be the sovereign. Secondly, we are finite. You know, our 
understanding is limited, whereas God is infinite. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows all things and what works out best for his creation. Um, I think everyone would probably agree that 1 Corinthians 13, 12, we now see in a, in a glass darkly, but we'll then understand fully in that coming day. I think we look at that verse and believe that that's what it's leading us to. One day we will understand these things in full measure. But then many of the regulations of God had tangible benefits. So a lot of the health regulations were to actually set the people of God above all of their neighbours. They knew how to order society, how to provide for the needy. They were, they were godly, they were upright, and when things were good and they, they followed the Lord, they were healthy and well. That's not to say you'll have perfect health these days. We know that. And then fourthly, uh, they are a demonstration of God's holiness. So when we see God's standards here in the Old Testament, uh, same with the Ten Commandments. We can come to the Ten Commandments and say, I could never keep those commandments all of the time. You know, I'll do my best to worship God alone, or, or I'll do my best to obey my parents, or whatever it might be, but we know we've all failed. But what God is establishing is therefore we can come to an end of ourselves because he has provided something even better for us when it gets to the new covenant. And I think the fifth thing is uh, the priesthood, the tabernacle, the temple, the sacrificial system, and the law, they are actually anticipating something far better and far greater. They were good. The law is good, but it could never, ever bring us to Christ. We could never be saved by keeping the law. We'd just not be good enough. And the regulations given for Israel, which aren't repeated in the New Testament and given to the church, they eventually were abolished, and they were abolished by Christ. And uh, that's where uh, this passage is leading us. Uh, John, writing in chapter 1, verse 17 of the Gospel, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ in full measure. So that really, if you like, is the practice uh, that's what was going on in these verses. But I want us to think about the principle. So there's a key verse. The life of a creature is in the blood. I've given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's uh, life. Uh, just to, as an aside, really, the drinking or eating of blood was forbidden, as we read here. That was given to the Jews. But I don't think there's any doubt that that would be true for us today. Um, I don't think that would be a problem for anyone here, I can't imagine, but probably Acts 15.29 would lead us to believe that is appropriate even today. Why then is blood so special? I don't know if you noticed in our Bible reading, but in those four verses alone, there are nine mentions of blood. So clearly it's significant, and it's significant because of what all these things were foreshadowing. There is a big difference between the Old and the New Testament. So when you're reading the Old Testament, I think without exception, when the mention of blood comes, it is always literal. It's always literally talking about blood. When you come to the New Testament, it is much more often symbolic. And I can give you uh, an example of that. And uh, John Stott says this, it's not an image to be visualized, but a symbol to be interpreted. And here's what, just one example um, in Revelation. So where John is anticipating heaven and all the glory that is ahead of us, just taking the end of that verse that I put up on screen. Uh, they're wearing white robes. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Clearly that is symbolic, isn't it? You don't wash clothes in blood to make them white. It's the absolute opposite to what you do. And there are many verses where actually symbolism um, and a spiritual application is the, is the right way forward. Um, just again as a small outside, uh, aside, 
I was once challenged as a young preacher after I'd finished preaching. I think I was about 20, I can't remember exactly. It was a church in Somerset, which shall go and not mention because it's still, <laughs> still going today, Gospel Hall. And um, look, I don't, I don't mind being challenged, and no preacher should. It helps to keep us humble, and it can help avoid uh, error or bias. It doesn't mean to say we always have to agree with what we're challenged on. Um, but the particular dear brother in the Lord said to me after I preached, always mention the blood. Always mention the blood. Do you know, I think he's wrong. <laughs> the blood particularly is symbolic of the death of Christ. And the, the means of that, of course, was by the shed blood of Christ. But he was kind of elevating it almost to a, a superstitious level where you've got to say it or the miracles won't happen or people can't be converted. And I just don't think that's what the Bible is teaching at all. The manner of Christ's death was important and the timing of his, de of his death. So Galatians 4, when the time, set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. The fact that Jesus was crucified upon a cross and that involved his blood being shed. You remember the spear through his side are all significant. You, you, you won't escape that, I think, when you read the Bible and see the significance of the death of Christ upon the cross. And uh, Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And another verse, Ephesians 1, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. But what the Old Testament events are doing, they are pointing to Christ. The more you read the Bible, brother, you're nodding your head and I'm saying amen because it's absolutely true. The more you read the Bible, you see it all pointing to Christ and the plan of redemption that God is working out uh, in the world and he's still working that one through today. And some of the biggest events of the Old Testament are absolutely so clearly foreshadowing the future. So you'll remember, some of you, that Abraham was asked by God, it would appear, to offer his son Isaac upon the altar. Well, that was never going to happen. God wouldn't ask him, but he was testing his faith. And um, Isaac said to his dad, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And God did provide a ram which was then sacrificed on that altar. And that was then a substitute for Isaac. And that's a, a, such an important point. Uh, the Bible, 2 Corinthians 5 says, God made him who had no sin, that's Christ, to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Here's the principle of substitution when it comes to atonement coming through. Then probably the most notable of all the things in the Old Testament that look forward to Christ is the Passover. Do you remember that the Jewish families down there in slavery in Egypt to avoid the, the judgment and the death that was coming upon the whole land, they had to sacrifice an animal. And they, they ate the animal, but the blood had to be applied to the doorposts and the lintels around their homes. And that's they did, and they escaped that judgment, all the death that was coming. How significant when Jesus was um, up in the upper room with his disciples not long before he died. This is my body, he says, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, some people get confused by that and take this to be literal. Well, Jesus is not speaking literally. It's a symbolism. It's a picture. It's a metaphor. Um, John 6, 53, Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And people say, oh, this is horrible. This is horrendous. Well, there was one sacrifice for sin forever. Christ has died. He was buried and he's risen again. No longer will the reality of that, what we do when we, as we come this morning to break bread, we have symbols and signs very simply pointing to Christ. 
Um, the Jewish family, and of course the Jews still remember Passover, typically the head of the home uh, would take bread, and of course it's unleavened bread, isn't it, they, they use, and he would say, this is the bread of the affliction which our fathers ate when they came out of Egypt. This is the bread of the affliction which our fathers ate when they came out of Egypt. Is he saying that literally this is the bread? No, he's not. It's not 2,000-year-old bread. That's gone a long time ago. It's a symbol. It's an illustration. And when we come to remember the Lord shortly, we're, we're just really embracing all that was foreshadowed in the Old Testament. Christ, our Passover lamb, is sacri- has been sacrificed for us. And then this is the, now the time in the Old Testament that you would have been thinking of. Some long time ago, the annual Day of Atonement. And this was uh, Leviticus 16, is it? Um, where Aaron, who was the high priest, first of all, he had to offer a sacrifice for his own sin and the sin of his family. And then a goat was taken and sacrificed for the sin of the whole nation. And it was then that Aaron could go into the most holy place once a year, one person and one sacrifice, and blood was spilt on that uh, cover of the Ark of the Covenant. I haven't put the verse up on screen, but uh, cl- not this one, but Colossians uh, 2 verse 17 says this, when it looks at all of that system in the Old Testament, these are a shadow of the things that were to come The reality, however, is found in Christ. Friend, if you're reading through these books of the Old Testament, they can get heavy in terms of embracing what the law and the sacrifices and the offerings and the priests, what were they all about? Well, what they were all about was anticipating Christ. We see Christ in the whole of the Bible. Look to find Christ because he is the one who has fulfilled all that these things anticipated. And that is very clear right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist himself says, Behold, or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I put up there 1 John 2, 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ has opened up a new and a living way, even by his shed blood for us says uh, Hebrews 10 um, that we have now the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience having our bodies washed with pure water let's move on towards uh, the end Christ has been revealed in a wonderful way in the Bible and I don't know whether you spotted it as we were thinking about those Old Testament uh, examples So here was Abraham and Isaac, one lamb as a substitute for one person, which was Isaac. The next one, the Passover, one lamb for a whole family. When it came to the annual day of atonement, one lamb or an offering for a whole nation. But what about Christ in his eternal, once for all sacrifice, One lamb slain for the whole world. In Christ, in Christ alone, we have a perfect sinless sacrifice, willing to die on our part, willing to shed his blood, that through him we will be able to be reconciled to God, through him redeemed, set free, in order that we might serve the living God. Uh, This is what, as we come to a conclusion, uh, there's been a lot of verses there, a lot of things to think about. But look at this beautiful verse in Romans 3. Now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness, God's righteousness, is given to us through faith in Jesus Christ to all believe. No difference between Jew and Gentile. We've all sinned but we're justified fully, freely by his grace. And the end of that section, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood 
to be received by faith. It was essential. Uh, God has done all that we need. But we need to take and embrace that message, my friend. And one illustration with the Passover. Do you remember how the lamb was sacrificed, the blood was shed, but the blood had to be applied by the family to their doorposts and lintels? It's the same principle for us when we come to Christ. We must have personal faith in him. We can't just say, well, God, you've done a great thing. I can see that as fantastic. And then walk away unchanged by that message. We come saying, Lord, I believe and therefore I give you my life. I put my trust, my faith in you. From now on, with your help, I, I will lead a life that honors you and I anticipate together uh, eternity with him and with one another. Well, may God uh, bless that word to us. If there's anything not clear, even if you want to argue over the details, please feel free to speak to me after. Let's just briefly pray. Father, thank you for your word. Pray that uh, anything which was not uh, of yourself will be quickly forgotten, but that you will help to remind us of all the significance of Christ who died for us upon the cross. Thank you that the Old Testament anticipated that with all the sacrifices and the offerings. And Lord, we're so glad that you were willing to pay the price of our redemption. And if we've known you a long time, may it be something that again thrills us. May it be something that captivates our hearts afresh, that we might live for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.